Shortly after meeting the next speaker, Dr. Michael Wesch, uh, I found out that we both liked riding bicycles, which was great, because it was a great way to connect. But I find out, or, but the reason I always have liked riding bicycles was because it's hip. My, my bike's really bright. Um, because I could save gas, because I didn't have to go through parking lots, I could just go straight to the building. Very functional in its means. But one day in class, Dr. Wesh said something about um, biking year-round because in the wintertime he wanted to be able to feel the cold winter air on his face. In the spring he wanted to feel the rain on his body. And it changed the way that I bike. It went from purely functional to something much more wonderful. With that, Dr. Wesh will be speaking about the end of wonder in the age of whatever. <laughs> that was such a perfect introduction. <laughs> um, you know, so I want to tell a story about my own experience here at K-State as a student. So I was actually a student in this room about 15 years ago. And it was sort of a classic lecture where everybody around me was sort of writing down the answers or writing down what they, uh, all the information so then they could regurgitate these answers on the next exam. Um, but for me, this being an anthropology class, which is a study of all humans in all times and all places, for me, being a small town kid uh, from right around here, it was giving me more questions than answers. And what I came to understand was that those questions were gifts, and they were the gifts that were gonna drive me for the rest of my life on a quest. These were questions that burned in my soul, that still burn in my soul to this day. And so I came back, uh, maybe seven years later, I came back as a professor. I actually got the job of Marty Ottenheimer, who was the one who had inspired all those questions in me, and I got his job. And so now I'm back in the same room, and I paused midway through the first semester just to check in. Like, am I inspiring the same kinds of questions that were inspired in me? Are, are there questions burning in these students' souls? So I paused midway through. We were about to have an exam review, and these were the questions that came back. How many points is this worth? How long does this paper need to be? There's a paper coming up. What do we need to know for this test? <laughs> like, like, these are terrible questions, right? Uh, <laughs> Not, not exactly the questions that will burn in their soul forever. And these are, and this is really important. Like, I've thought a lot about this, especially recently. I started thinking more and more about questions and, and thinking about, like, what would it be like if we really organized our entire learning process around questions instead of answers? And so here's what I want to say about questions. First off, they, like, a really good question really is the beginning of a quest because the best answers to the best questions are just more questions. And so you just live question after question. That's certainly been the story of my life. And, and I find myself embracing the questions, really being uh, entranced by them. The second thing about questions is that they connect us. They connect things in our mind. So every time you get a new question, it kind of reframes things in your mind and you get new ideas, you're connecting new ideas. But it also connects us to each other. I mean, the question really is like the most amazing thing humans do, that we can actually come to the edge of our thought and then reach out across that, that crevice that's there to, to the abyss to somebody else who maybe can help us think through something. I, I don't think it's any mistake that questions are the most common greetings around the world. There's no better way to make a connection. And then the third thing I would say about questions is that you, know, you notice that almost everywhere in the world, in about almost all 6,000 languages, there's about 70 languages where this isn't true, but in the rest of these languages, you raise your intonation when you ask a question. And John O'Hala at Berkeley, he's a linguist there, suggests that this is probably a signal that is connected to, uh, that you find in mammals, you find it in, in many birds, and it's a signal where we raise our pitch when we want to express a sense of vulnerability or submission, and we lower our pitch when we want to tell somebody to stand off. And so you think of a dog, for example, it'll growl to tell you to back off, or it'll, it'll do a little hoo, hoo, and raises its pitch to tell you to come in. And I think that's what's happening when we're asking questions. It's a signal of us embracing our vulnerability, making ourselves small, and opening ourselves up to others. And that's really quite a courageous thing to do. It's not, it's not gonna happen on its own. It's something that's gonna have to be fostered and nurtured. And it's something uh, ultimately very, very challenging. So I want to tell you a quick story about the power of doing that, though, right? Because if, if a question is something that leads you on a quest, connects you with others, 
and allows you to embrace your vulnerability. Imagine what it is to live with questions, question after question after question. It would be to live in a state of wonder. And that's what I want for my students. And so I want to tell you a story about questions and how they've guided me. Then I'm going to tell you about why it's so hard to get people to ask questions, ask really good questions. And then we're going to come back to, to some things that are happening here that are, are doing the job. So, so first, um, let me tell you about my own experience. So I came out of this class with all of these questions burning in my soul. And the only way I could figure to answer them was to really get out into the world. So I decided to go to New Guinea. And this was just as far away as I can imagine. And so I went to this place to just experience what humanity could be like in all of its variety. So I came to New Guinea. I pull into my hotel here. This is the, the only shot I ever took from the hotel because the first day I had this idea that I was going to go walk around and meet as many people as possible, build these connections, and open myself up to new worldviews and all that kind of stuff. And so I walk out my hotel the first day. I put on my backpack, and um, I'm walking. To, uh, this first two people I meet, they say, hey, Moni. And now in, in pidgin English, they speak, they speak like a pidgin English. Today. That can mean one of two things. It could mean uh, good morning, like, hey, morning. Or it could mean give me your money. <laughs> and, <laughs> and like I'm this small town kid, and I'm just opening myself up to the world. So I figure they're saying good morning. And so I very cheerfully say, oh, morning, morning. You know? and, I, and then these guys say, no, God, morning, morning. And they start patting their pockets like this. So now I know what they're doing, but I decide to kind of play dumb. And so I just cheerfully again say, oh, morning, morning, and I try to slide past them. And this doesn't work. They step in front of me, and the one guy pulls his jacket back, and he's got this two-foot machete in there. And he pulls it out. And, and I, again, I'm just kind of like, oh, morning, morning. And he's like, no, <laughs> money. <laughs> and I turn my back to him as I see this knife, and thinking if he slashes at me, he'll just maybe hit my backpack. And I just start running. And I get around this corner. And fortunately, around the corner were all the good people that I hoped I would meet. And they chase these two guys off. And I walk straight to the airport. And, <laughs> and this is where I learned the power of questions. Because I'm looking up at the board. And you know, they got this departure board. And the first departure is, is Brisbane. And I thought, Brisbane, that's a, that would be a good place to go. It's on, the, you know, it's on the coast of Australia. I could learn to surf. It could be a great summer. Um, and then down the list are all these places I had, you know, barely heard of, and they were small sort of villages throughout New Guinea. And I realized as I was looking up at that board that my answers were not in Brisbane. They were somewhere down the list. And so I got on a plane to somewhere else. And I flew plane after plane after plane, taking smaller and smaller planes until I landed on this airstrip here. And then I kept walking, and I walked through village after village, and I got to places that I never thought I would have the courage to go. But I went there because I had these questions burning in my soul, and nothing was going to stop me. So I ended up coming to this place here. I ended up staying in houses like this off and on for eight years. Uh, I joined the local economy, which doesn't involve cash. It's all growing your own food, taro, sweet potato, bananas. They raise pigs, harvest spiders. You eat snake when you have a chance. Um, snakes are a good deal, because after a snake eats, it gets lazy, and it just like lays around. And then you can cut it open. You can see the thing there, and you get the appetizer. <laughs> and this is me in the corner here. And this is, you know, this was my life. And, and I loved this life, but not actually at first. I mean, it would be a gross uh, misrepresentation to say this was all just wonderful. In fact, uh, I went back to my uh, diaries this past summer and read them. And I realized that I was deeply sad for about eight months. And I realized what had happened was, I thought growing up in Nebraska, you know, I grew up in a small town in Nebraska, and I thought that who I was was something inside of me that I, I took great care in sort of crafting myself, crafting my identity, and I thought that was something inside of me that I projected outward. And what I realized when I was in this very foreign environment, that who we are is actually reflected back to us by the people around us. And when people around you don't know why you're there or what you're doing or who you are, you start asking the same questions. And so, I mean, it goes to say something about, you know, the type of care that Greg mentioned earlier, that we would have to provide in a, in a large environment like this to, to make people feel welcome, to make them feel like they have a place. Um, but there was something else that happened soon after that. Uh, what got me out of this funk was I was walking along this ridge, and it was absolutely gorgeous, but I am so sad 
that, and it actually the gorgeousness of this ridge is actually making me more sad because I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, this is what I wanted to do with my life. I'm here doing exactly what I want to do, looking at this beautiful landscape, and I feel terrible. And like, why do I feel terrible? And so I, I actually got so sad, I actually started to feel weak. And, and I, and I, I mean, I actually sort of collapsed on the side of this ridge, and I'm crying on this ridge here. And these two guys who are walking behind me come up behind me, and by the time they get to me, they're crying too. And I had this amazing uh, moment, right? I mean, how, I mean the, the, the empathy that they had at that moment to cry there with me. And then they said, uh, Why are you, what are you crying about? And I said, I, I miss my wife. And they laughed and laughed, and they said, oh, we would never miss our wives. <laughs> and, then, and then they said, but we miss our kids. And, and then they started crying with me again. This is, this is them there. Um, and it's, that empathy was really something, right? And, and, uh, and, so, and empathy is important because empathy is directly connected to wonder and curiosity because empathy is this capacity to imagine your way into somebody else's perspective, which is exactly what they did. Really amazing. But what we see is that there's evidence that college students are actually have less empathy uh, than past generations. Some people blame new technologies. I think it's something bigger than that. I think if you think where, about where empathy comes from, in New Guinea you could say, well, it's so strong because they share their lives. But I think it's more than that. They don't just share their lives. They share everything. They share all their vulnerabilities. All of their frailties are right there. They share their deaths as well. And there's no denying it. You sit there and you watch friends die. And there's really not much you can do about it. And in these moments, what I found was just this tremendous sense of vulnerability and frailty uh, that I shared with everybody around me. And I couldn't help but feel more connected to all of them. What we've done in our society is we use technologies, new technologies. I'm a big fan of new technologies. You guys probably all know that. But, but we actually tend to use these technologies in ways that actually block us off, that, that disconnect us. So we build boxes and then shop in these boxes and look through these boxes. And then over time, we just built more boxes and shopped in bigger boxes and looked through these boxes. And all along, you know, by the time year 2000, Robert Putnam was able to say we're bowling alone, that our levels of community had declined. There's another phrase that I like, Livian de Couture talks about the capsular civilization, that we live in capsules and put ourselves in other capsules that transport us to yet another capsule. And all the while, it's kind of disconnecting. This has really big effects on how we grow up and how we see the world and whether or not we're open to the world, whether or not we're ready to explore it. Peter White talks about growing up in the 1950s. This is him here some years later in Kenya, and he says, that when he was growing up in the 1950s, he, it was just expected that he would, he would run around the neighborhood unsupervised, even as a very small child. He got a little older and he learned to ride a bike, and then he got still older, and he, when he was a teenager, he started hitchhiking 100 miles and then being back home by nightfall. That, and it just people did that in the 50s. That Peter White did all that in the 1950s, even though Peter White is blind. And then you think about that and you think, wow, he you know, went around the neighborhood unsupervised. He learned to ride a bike and he had the scars to prove it, but you know, he was going to do it because everybody else did it. And then he put his faith in strangers as a blind kid. And it's just a, that's a level of public trust that we can't even imagine today. So we were raising our kids on leashes. Um, you know, just for comparison, this is a friend of mine in New Guinea. That's a real knife. I don't know if you see the difference. <laughs> And then, you know, and, and as adults, then we become the most addicted, medicated, obese, in debt, and busy adult cohort in human history. We are numbing ourselves, and you cannot numb emotions selectively. This is from Brene Brown. She's talking about how you can't numb yourself to pain and disconnection without also numbing yourself to joy and connection. And so then they, we'd send them off to school, and of course they get the same thing, right? So... Uh, this is from Kelly's presentation, and the same, they, we give them the same academic preparation, they, they, they have this, uh, we treat them as if they have the same interest in the subject, same motivation to learn, and of course, all of this is really just a game, they see it as a game, and I love games, and Ben has great games that he could tell you about, the great learning games, but this is a different kind of game, this is the game of, let's sneak past our learning. And in this game, the winners actually don't even turn out too well. This is, this is a winner here. This is a valedictorian from Georgia. This is Erica Goldson. And this is what she said about being valedictorian. I wonder, why did I even want this position? Sure, I earned it, but what will come of it? 
When I leave educational institutionalism, will I be successful or forever lost? I have no clue about what I want to do with my life. I have no interest because I saw every subject of study as work, and I excelled at every subject just for the purpose of excelling, not learning. And quite frankly, now I'm scared. And then we send them off to school, and they go into these big places like this, and we have this place called the university, and then this other place is called the real world. It's not the university. And, <laughs> and then you go on to campus, and you, know, you look around campus, and we have art here, and science here, and music over here, history over here, engineering here, architecture here, anthropology over here. And the message of the place is that anthropology is not history, which is not engineering, which is not architecture, which is not art, which is not music. But of course, we know that all great questions transcend these disciplines. And play is over here, play is over here, and real world's over here. <laughs> and that brings us back to tonight. Because what you saw tonight was people, you know, going against this, this, this structure and, and changing things. We see that creativity has no disciplinary boundaries. We found this is from Chris's slides. And I mean, Chris, what a great example of somebody on a quest. This guy never stops learning. It's amazing. He's inspiring every time I see him because he, he has these questions that burn and they just turn into more questions. I mean, what a great model, you know? Like, I think what you saw tonight was people not just coming up with great ideas, but really modeling learning, like, you know, getting into it, thrashing around with concepts and, 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 and really struggling themselves. And we're reaching out to communities, we're reaching out and building community, and of course, to do that, we have to care. It's one of the most powerful messages, I think, from tonight is that sense of, you know, really deep care that it would take to encourage people to have this sense of, of wonder and curiosity. So these CAT communities, I think this is a great start for this, the ubiquitous library providing support everywhere. All these things that you saw tonight, teaching to the whole person, teaching to the body, not just the mind, and really getting our students ready to in, encounter failure as a blessing, not just as, you know, an F on a report card, like it's, it's so, we do so poorly with failure and yet it's so important for us to be able to embrace it. And that's what Chad was saying with the next big thing. I wanna end um, tonight with a vision. I wanna show you something that I think really expresses wonder better than anything. Cause I think this would be a very wonderful goal for us to aspire to get our students to up to is the sense of wonder. So you probably all have experienced wonder. I wanna show you what it looks like and have us think about what it would be to lift our students up to this place. So this is Wellington, New Zealand, where it never snows. And then in August, 2011, it did. And you can see like what happens, right? Like people are caught out in their t-shirts and, and you know, sort of caught off guard, but they're not like running anywhere, they're embracing it. And that's what wonder is like. It's like an embrace of the world. It's not bundling up your coat. It's not running into the stores. It's running out of them. There's a certain, there's a, like an ecstasy of being together. You feel more connected. There's really two sides to wonder. You know, we talk about you can, you know, you, you, you're in wonder. That's like that sense of awe. But you can also wonder about something. And these two things, I think, are directly connected. So here you'll see like this sense of awe, this fascin this, this like elation, which so quickly turns to fascination, contemplation, and investigation. And it's not just curiosity. I think wonder can be more than just curiosity. Because curiosity can be sort of a seeking after answers and facts. I think wonder is being okay with questions. <laughs> it's like being a kid again, right? And you see, when you're in wonder, you see like a kid again. You see new connections. You see connections where you thought you might not see them. And what I really like about sitting with wonder, sitting with contemplation, is that every little thing starts to matter. And that, to me, was the beauty of you know helping organize this and then sitting through these presentations was it was like a show of people who love what they do who are living in wonder and it to me it's almost like really like a sense of, of, of reverence for the world and just wanting to know more
It turns out, just one last thought, it turns out that, that wonder is actually one of the most changeable things about people in their personality. So if people are, if you're in your class and you think, man, these people are not aspiring to wonder, just bear with it. Like it's one of the most changeable things. You actually can inspire people to wonder. And I want to be clear about this. It's not, I'm not saying we should go for the experience of wonder. It's like love. Like we think of love as a, an experience too. And so we, we shape ourselves and we try to like bring on this experience of love. But as we get older, we realize that love is actually a capacity. It's something you do. And wonder can be the same way. It's not just going to the Grand Canyon or having it snow in Wellington. It's a capacity. It's something you can grow and nurture and get better at. And I hope that you were all inspired to do that tonight. Thanks.